So the competition um, authorities are formed of the Competition Commission, um, the Tribunal, and effectively the Appeal Court. So the Commission investigates cases, the Tribunal hears cases, effectively it's a court, and then there's a Competition Appeal Court, which is a division of the High Court. So that's, that's the kind of process they go through. Like, and then it goes after, you can appeal higher up all the way to the Constitutional Court, like that's happened with a couple of cases recently. Okay? And in terms of what we do, um, there's really three main areas of the Competition Act. We look at mergers. Uh, we ha look at horizontal restrictive practices, which are cartels. Uh, and we look at unilateral conduct. So mergers, if you think about it, mergers, two firms that were competitors get together. So that could be a potential lessening of competition if they were competitors. A cartel says two firms who are, who are competitors don't get together in a merger, but they get together and agree to carve the market up. So it's a bit like they've merged in the sense that they're working together jointly. And abuse of dominance is unilateral powers where you've got a firm which on its own doesn't have to agree with anybody. Um, it's got enough monopoly power. So those are the three areas um, of our, the three main areas of our work. Um, and I can, so if people have got questions about any of those, I can come back to it. But what I wanted to talk about is really why do we care about competition? What is competition? Because when I read about it, I think there are lots of popular misconceptions about what competition actually is. Particularly, people write about competition as if it's different from, as if um, it's somehow in conflict with instability. That if there's instability and turmoil in the market, those are not properly competitive markets. Um, somehow, you know, if there's, there's, there's a shortage in a market or there's excess supply, that somehow those markets are not properly competitive. So we, and that's not the case, I want to argue. I want to case, argue that competition is a choice to have a rough and tumble, uncertain, unstable environment rather than a very stable, uh, certain environment which is the world of central planning or regulation, or both. You know, regulation to achieve central planning. And this is not hypothetical. We had central planning of many markets in this country before 1994. Agricultural markets until the mid-1980s were run by control boards. They were called control boards. You could only sell your product to the board. The board told you as a farmer that was the price you're going to get. So there was really, I mean, in, in, you could argue that we did central planning, at least the apartheid state did central planning better than the Soviet Union in some of these areas. So when we took away the control boards, when they were abolished under 1996, um, uh, uh, the Marketing of Agricultural Products Act, we then chose a world which was much more volatile, much harder for participants in some ways. If you're a maize farmer, you're planting today, you don't know what the price is going to be when you harvest. In the past, when you planted that, you knew what the price was going to be. So, and there, you know, that's obviously, that could be, a, that's a good thing for certainty in terms of farmers. So, people sometimes say, well, because there's all this uncertainty, these markets are not properly competitive. Competitive markets are uncertain, just like competitive rugby, cricket, football, you know. It depends what happens. It's really, un, it's really, it's really dynamic. So, why do we care about competition? Well, people normally say you care about competition because you have lower prices which in general is true. You can have lower prices if people are competing than if firms are colluding together or if you've got a monopoly. If you have a monopoly, you have no competition. If you have collusion, you have no competition. Okay? But lower prices are, are the outcome of a process. And what's more important, I'm going to argue in the process, is you've got much more innovation and dynamism in terms of service, quality, innovation, product development, different business models. And what happens is people launch things and try things and some of them fail. Okay? I'm going to give some illustrations. People say, I've got a new business model, I've got a new format, and sometimes it doesn't work, just like new newspapers. But competition is about that process of dynamism where people try these different things, and the whole point is that some of them will succeed and others will fail. Whereas if you've got a regulated market, you don't try. You say people like things the way they are and we'll keep on doing it in that way. 
and we'll plan it in that way. In other words, there's going to be, you might use fewer resources if you plan centrally than if you have competition, because if you have competition, you are going to waste resources. People will build things, build factories to produce goods that then flop. So think about the money that was put into that factory, the good that flopped. It's kind of a waste. But that's part of the process. On the other hand, you have a new business model coming up, like Fruit and Veg City, Food Lovers Markets. I don't know if any, how many of you have been to Food Lovers Markets. I have. Okay. Pick and Pay wanted to buy Fruit and Veg City six years ago. If they'd bought Fruit and Veg City, you wouldn't have had Food Lovers Markets. So if you've been to those Food Lovers Markets, you should be very happy <laughs> that we stopped the merger. <laughs> okay? But they may have, they may have failed. Right? They may have failed. That's what entrepreneurs do. They try things out, and they put together those propositions, and sometimes they succeed, and sometimes they don't. So what is also, so it's about this whole process, but it's also about uh, a, a set of, of, if you like, you can characterize it as values of norms, but it's also about opportunity and access. Because... You can't try these things if you don't, in a positive sense, have the opportunity to do that. Fruit and City can't launch food lovers markets if there were exclusive leases over every shopping mall. So to bring that to a very concrete area of where we are now, we've been investigating supermarkets. And we started off investigating four issues in supermarkets, which came out of complaints and concerns. It wasn't stuff we dreamt up. People said the supermarkets were too strong over their buyers. They squeezed their buyers. People said the supermarkets control, they have category management systems about how they put things on their shelves. They, people said they're colluding together. We dropped all of those. The fourth thing was, people said there are exclusive leases where you go into a, a mall, a mall says, look, I want an anchor tenant for my mall. Supermarket says, okay, I'll be your anchor tenant. So you can build your mall. But there will be no other bakery, no other butchery, no other biltong store, no liquor store, no other supermarket in that mall. Nobody you compete with me, no other grocery. Therefore, you can't have a fruit and veg city in that mall. You can't have the next business model evolving. So we're still investigating whether, as a matter of fact, that was a substantial lessening of competition. Because you've seen fruit and veg city started in their separate places. They didn't start in malls. If there were exclusive leases, I'm not saying there are in every mall, that's an evidence question. Then they, wouldn't have, and, and then they wouldn't be able to get into any of those malls. So starting in this imperfect way. Okay? So you can see competition is up out. What do you require here? You can be free to compete, but you're not free to compete if you can't get your input. You can be free to enter as a bakery, but you're not free to enter if nobody will sell you flour. So competition is not just a negative thing, the absence of constraints. It's also in a potentially a positive thing, your ability to access inputs, your ability to access space. So it's a value judgment about what kind of market economy we want. When you get to these issues about access to facilities, etc., you're really in a, into a question of well, what kind of, 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 of type of capitalism, essentially, do we want? Because we're talking about a capitalist market economy. But what type? And countries have very different choices. Some countries have greater emphasis on these things. They talk about fair competition, really strong emphasis on this. We don't. We have a relatively weak emphasis. We only say you're impeded from or you're, you're, you're engaging in anti-competitive conduct when we prove a substantial lessening of competition. So to give you that fruit and veg city example, exclusive leases, if you find that a supermarket, one of the big two, let's say, has signed a lease with a mall where there will be no other supermarket, no other bakery, no other butchery, no other liquor store, no other grocery store in that mall for the next 30 years. You might say that's anti-competitive, it should be stopped. In some countries, the law would allow that lease to be struck down. Under the South African Act, we have to show a substantial lessening of competition. So we can't say that looks unfair, we'll address it. We have to show it has had a substantial lessening of competition effect. So there's a balance between the different things. Our test is called SLC, substantial lessening of competition. 
Things which emphasize this, it just can look at those types of arrangements, laws which emphasize this, such as Germany or Japan or South Korea. They have laws which say, that is unfair. I don't have to show it has a substantial effect. I can just look at it and I can say that's unfair. There isn't a strong enough, they put the onus on the parties to say why it's required, rather than the onus on the authority to say why it has a substantial effect. Yeah. yeah. Okay, just before I answer the question, one point I'm making, if I wasn't making it very clearly, is that there are, there's, a, there's a balancing act that goes on, and countries can embody this balancing act both in their laws themselves, but also in the criteria that are used, and in the emerging jurisprudence in how the courts look at it. Okay? So that balancing act is part of, you can't avoid it. You have, to do, you have to engage in that weighing up of the evidence. It's part of, as I said, part of the norms, rules, and conventions. Some people call it the economic constitution of a country. Okay? So you have to engage in that. Even, an, even refusing to engage in it, if you like, is engaging it. Okay? So then you get into all of these different questions that you're, you're talking about. Our law doesn't protect small business as small business at all. It says competition in order to achieve cheaper prices, greater choice, etc. It doesn't say that competition must mean lots of small stores. So it doesn't say we should like a small entrant because they're small, they're offering something different. <coughs> You've got to show that they are an effective rival. rival. So as you might have effective rivalry because you've got two firms slogging it out. Two might be enough. So you've got you know, ShopRite and Checkers. If they're there, they may be vigorously competing with each other. That's enough. OK? So does that yeah. answer your question? Um, it doesn't also mean there shouldn't be regulation at all. So for example, there's an issue some years ago about tow truck drivers. Too much competition. And the metro, I think it was somewhere in Limpopo, said, Look, we want to carve this out. We don't want all of the tow trucks chasing every single accident. That's too much competition. Right? <laughs> and you can see it's wasteful because you've got four driving. So competition is, it does involve duplication. Right? It involves duplication. And they said, well, let's have some regulation. Let's separate out the areas and say this association will work there, this association there, etc. Because ultimately, that's, that's going to be better. So there are choices about regulation. And you do need regulation anyway. Because there's, the, there are markets which are not going to work perfectly because of the nature of the markets themselves. So you do need regulation where you're not going to have effective competitive rivalry, or you might have harmful rivalry, and you might have regulation for competition. You might have regulation to enforce number portability between cell phones, so you can carry your number. Because if you don't enforce number portability, then it's very difficult for you to switch. So you might need regulation to ensure that consumers can switch. So it's not a dichotomy of regulation or competition, it's this intertwined set of rules, and what we would focus on is that those rules must work to ensure effective competitive rivalry. So effective rivalry is in terms of a dynamic process where you're rewarding, you're rewarding effort, you're rewarding ideas, you're rewarding innovation. So people will be able to switch, move to where the ideas, the innovation, the effort is coming from. So you, it's, a, it's a dynamic process of rivalry. Okay? That's the point I'm, I want to emphasize. Now, I was going to give some examples. I've talked briefly about, about supermarkets. Cement is a case I get quite often. So under, this, under apartheid, the cement industry was a legal cartel um, until 1996. So um, it was planned so that wherever the cement was required, it would be sourced from the plant, the factory closest. And it was sourced by rail. So it was a central planning to allocate cement from the factories to where it was required and to put most of it on rail. Um, the liberalization in 1996, ending the cartel, meant you know, cement producers could compete to sell wherever they wanted. They had a price war for a couple of years, 
and then they decided this wasn't very good because you know, price wars are only good for consumers. And they got together in Port Shepston and agreed to carry on with the cartel. So the big cement producers got together and they said, okay, let's go back to the arrangement we had before. But without public regulation, private regulation. So you have a cartel. And we've just, well, we've got settlements from Lafarge and Afrisam, and PPC admitted the conduct and got leniency. And uh, Natal Portland has been, NPC is still defending the case. So they agreed, they cartelized, and they separated the market out, and they rigged the whole of Southern Africa. So Botswana, Namibia, Lesotho, Swaziland, uh, and South Africa, and they allocated shares. That's the case that was admitted. Um, and we've had people, and they did it through information exchange. So every month, they sent in information on their sales. And then they would get back the information on the total sales, and that enabled them to stick to the same market shares. So if you send your sales, if we all send our sales in, I know I'm meant to have 30%. And I'll be able to look and see when I get it back and see, do I still have 30%? And we've stopped that. And people are very unhappy because they say, look what's happening in the cement industry. Nobody knows how to plan their investments anymore. Nobody knows, the Reserve Bank doesn't know what's happening with construction because they use this as an indicator of construction activity, how much cement was being sold. So people are very unhappy with us. All your economists from Mike Schuster and them, he has to sell his product to Gauteng. He wants to tell Hateng how much construction uses cement. That's fine if you want to make that choice. But the outcome is cement prices have fallen for the first time ever in the past year. If you look at the producer price index data, the cement prices went up like this every six months. Every six months, January and July, they went up by around about an average of 6%. They never went down. There was a boom in demand. Demand collapsed. Cement prices never came down. Now, what have they done? Well, they're going all over the place, they're up and down, there's specials, there's rebates, people are advertising. You might hear adverts on the radio for the first time. Now, advertising is a waste of money, right? <laughs> it is. If you know you're buying cement and it's got this specification, I need 42.5 whatever MPA cement, why, why do I need, all I need to know is, is it SABS approved? Is it actually 42.5 strength cement? That's all I need to know. <laughs> so advertising is a waste of money. The costs go up, right? But now they're advertising, so competition wastes money, right? They're transporting now, much further away. You might be right next to PPC. Remember, you know, with you, I'm saying you're a big construction project or your cash build or something like that. But you might say, look, I want to get from Lafarge. Remember, Lafarge will give you a better price. That means Lafarge drives it much further. Right? That's what happens. They sell against each other into each other's natural markets. But there's a lot more pressure on those managers because they used to own their customers. They used to own their market share. So I'm sure there's much more emphasis on getting stuff to the customers on time, providing the right advisory services. Maybe you don't need that strength. Maybe you need this strength, etc. And they're obviously doing branding as well. So competition is about that effort. So yes, there are some things that might have raised costs. And people are building cement plants. The Sapaku is building a plant. There's a Chinese company building a plant. Which maybe there's going to be overinvestment. Maybe there's going over to maybe there's gonna be too much cement in two years' time. But what competition means is people take bets differently and separately on what's going to happen in the future. Like what's going to happen with demand. Is Transnet serious? You know, when they say we're going to build all this infrastructure. If they are, people should be putting in investment. If they're not, they're going to be sitting with their cement plants. So competition means you make those bets. And the people who make the right bets win out of it. Okay. So that's the cement, the cement uh, story. It is a more uh, turbulent situation and less certainty, less knowledge about exactly how much cement is being sold every month. But prices have come down um, when demand Prices came, came down. Um, similar, um, and there's been two new entrants into the market um, uh, in the last couple of years, um, bringing on stream, bringing uh, uh, new product on, on stream. Um, the third case that I was going to talk about was concrete, um, concrete pipes, and then um, talk briefly about information exchange and different mechanisms. Um, concrete pipes was an important decision for us, not very important for many people in the country. But if you imagine those big pipes you see beside the road, 
They normally have Rockla or Infraset stamped on them. Or the culverts that are like this, three sides. Okay, what I'm talking about. So this cartel had been running since 1970s. 30, over 30 years. These are subsidiaries of Murray and Roberts and of Veng. So these are, and the reason why I'm talking about it is because of what we think the value of competition is and also what we think the importance of the deterrence mechanism is. So this cartel was running and one company called Southern Pipeline Contractors, SPC, operated in Gauteng. It thought the fine was too high and it went to the appeal court. So most companies settled with the commission. The tribunal had to impose penalties on two. And the one I'm talking about, the penalty was about 15 million rands, I think, Southern Pipeline. It was part of the Kharateng, uh, Kharateng arrangement. And then they went to the CAC, and the CAC said, there's no evidence that prices were increased by the cartel. No evidence was led to say prices were increased by the cartel. Now, the way the concrete pipes cartel worked was in each of three major areas, you got a share of the market, just like in cement. And then they priced against each other to make it look like there was competition. So they'd look at all the contracts, and they say, OK, to hit our target market share, maybe our target market share, there's three of us, was 40, 40, 20. OK? So they say, OK, they keep running scores. I'm at 35. I should be at 40. So there's another contract coming up, ran water. I must get that contract. That's OK, you've got the contract. They put the price in, then the others put a cover price on top. They put a price which is a bit higher. So they rigged the tenders. Okay? We've been doing it for, I mean, decades, literally. Okay? Now, Southern Pipeline said to the appeal court, they said, look, there's no evidence of what the prices would have been. They're right. There's never been competition. How do you work it out what the prices should be? And they said, look, it's a market allocation arrangement, not price fixing. So you divided the markets, allocating the shares. You didn't fix the prices exactly. And we didn't have enough capacity, so we wouldn't have gone higher than our share. Say our share was 20. We wouldn't have gone higher than our share because we didn't have enough capacity. So actually, we couldn't have been a more effective competitor. Now, the CAC agreed with them. They said, these fines are so large, they're, uh, they're, um, they're quasi-criminal because they're large. We said, no, it's the wrong framework. Competition and collusion are... To, you know, they're just natural tendencies. I always want to compete to win customers from you. But if you compete to win customers from me, we can always get together and agree things. Right? That does, these are natural tendencies. This is not, don't take a moral position on this. Don't talk about criminal or not. This is just business. You always want, I always want to steal customers. You always want to steal customers. But if we both end up giving cheaper prices to customers, then we have a price war. We slit each other's throats. Right? We make no money. Customers do well. We make no money. So if we get together and agree, then the price will stay up. And then we'll start stealing customers from each other. And price go, you know. So these are tendencies. What we have to do is we have to have, and it's about money. So the fines must be large because the cartel profits are large. The fines are not large that makes them criminal. The fines are just large because those are the, that's the amounts of money that are involved here. Okay. So I wanted to make a point about the natural tendencies and our deterrence. Our deterrence, uh, our, our lever is about deterrence in the context of those types of, 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 of that type of money that's being made in terms of, of, of cartels. What's happened since the ending of the Concrete Pipes Cartel, and there's a working paper we've done, it's on a UJ Center for Competition Economics, we found, interestingly, a lot more new companies setting up. Because a part of a cartel, if there's three of you, in a market, and you want to sustain the cartel, you must keep other people out. So you must stop other people setting up concrete pipes businesses. Because if you have this nice juicy margin, somebody else might come and set up a plant. So after the cartel ended, we've seen all this new players coming in. We've seen prices changing, rebates happening, all sorts of discounting. It's very difficult to work out how much prices went up by. But our assumption is prices got up by a substantial amount. Why are you doing it otherwise? You know it's wrong. Why are you doing it if it's not raising prices? So you need to have a big uh, penalty. Okay, so where, we are, where are we now? Looking forward, so, okay? So where we've come, to, if I want to give a, a kind of uh, uh, 
It's now a 13 year, we're set up in 1999 uh, overview. The first few years, five years, six years, were about mergers. Because the act, the new act in 1999, so there's a new act in 1999, okay? So we kind of started then. It made merger notification compulsory. You had to notify your merger and get it approved before you go ahead with it if you're above a certain threshold. So we spent a lot of time on mergers, okay? So the first phase, maybe to plus minus 2005, six was about mergers. In fact, in 2003, there was even a peer review by the OECD which said, there aren't very many cartels. That shows how strong and effective the competition authorities are. People must be so scared that they've stopped doing it. That was a 2003 OECD review. Actually, we just weren't looking, okay? Then we started looking. We had leniency policy. Leniency policy said, if you come first, you pay no penalty, okay? But you must admit. And if you admit, you are open to damages claims. So you don't admit just to, because you don't like your rival. You pretend you had a cartel. That opened a floodgate. So 2006, 2007, we are involved in prioritization. And what we do is we go out looking for cartels. We look for cartels and we incentivize people to come forward. Because why would you come forward if you're never going to get caught anyway? You only come forward to tell and exchange for free, no penalty is if you think you might get caught. So we go out, priori prioritize. And we were lucky. Bread, distributor came forward. This concrete pipes case came up. These are subsidiaries of Murray and Roberts Narvain. They started saying, well, my God, what's going on here? They came forward with a whole lot of leniency applications. So we find cartels under every stone. Really, I mean, you know. It's like small industries, three, four, five players, the economics say they should be colluding. It's like the shareholders would be mad if they weren't. I mean, the shareholders make money from the collusion. So you can moralize what you want, but ultimately, you know, when you've got this tight knit, you'll find, why, why should we compete? Why don't you stay in Gauteng and I'll stay in Durban? Why, why am I going to go and invest in your backyard and you invest in mine? You know, it's, it's, just, it's just the way business worked. It's comfortable. And this is the same in other countries, not South African phenomenon. It's normal. So that was cartels, and then we've, we're still going on cartels. So it's cartels. Right through to 2012. Now we're having a fight about penalties. The penalties that we think are not big enough. We think they're ridiculously low. Other people say, my God, you, these institutions are too powerful, invasive, chilling business, you know, outrageously high penalties. You read Yanni Mouton's book, he says, you know, we we're so unfair, penalizing pioneer, etc. It's just because they were Africana businesses, he says. We got I can tell you, it's not true. It's a bread cartel, a flour cartel, a mealy meal cartel, right? You, I mean, you have to, you, does every, everybody knows this. So you couldn't set up a bakery because you had to buy from the flour cartel. There are lots more bakeries around. I mean, if you go in this, this new bread bakery su supplying particularly in townships. So they were running, so, so he says, and he says his fine was too high. Well, the fine was too high. Premier got off free. Tiger paid 99 million. They told us about the whole cartel. If that hadn't big incentive hadn't been there, why will I come forward and tell if I don't think there's a massive fine if I don't? You know, I'm really breaking, I'm changing the way the industry operated by coming forward. It's a big step. So I'm only going to do it because I think otherwise it's a really big fine. So you need the big fines to incentivize the settlements and the cooperation. So we want the settlements and the cooperation. PPC paid no fine for the cement cartel. Okay? So it's all about incentives and deterrence. Running through this, so this has been cartels, okay? Now we're looking at information exchange, how industries have managed to continue. If you look at the flour and the bread, prices have not come down that much. If you look at the margins, take Tiger's baking and milling division. Take Pioneer's baking and milling. You can look at the results. You can look at their margin over turnover. It's come down slightly, but not very much, okay? So we're looking at other arrangements, which means you stabilize the industry with, with that. And typically what we're finding is information exchange arrangements where you all supply your sales data to an association and you get back the total. Now, if you know there's only three of you in the Eastern Cape, then you know if your share has gone down there, somebody's taken it from you, and then you can retaliate. And if the person stealing your customers knows you're going to retaliate very quickly, then they probably won't do it in the first place. 
Because the reason I offer a discount to you is because I want to increase my market share. If I know they're going to pick it up right away and offer you just as good a discount, I won't do it. Which is why that we'll meet your, where you go to a shop and they say, if you find it cheaper, we'll match the difference. That's very anti-competitive. Because what it means is the other shop says, why will I offer the discount? I won't make the sale anyway. You'll go to the same shop and just play me off, but I won't make the sale. So that's potentially in a tight oligopoly, not I'm saying in the retail environment, or there are cases in the retail environment. Those arrangements mean I won't offer the discount because I'm not going to get the sale because the other guy is going to retaliate. We both drop our prices 5 to 10% and we have the same shares as before. So if I monitor what you're doing, you monitor what I'm doing, then we achieve this outcome. So we're looking at information exchange. So we've referred one case of information exchange, which is between Mittal and Heifelt on steel plate, linked to things like fishing boats, etc. And they shared data. But all the agricultural chambers had information exchange. Uh, chamber of baking, chamber of milling, etc. Um, these guys. So information exchange is one, and the other is exclusionary conduct. So how does a monopoly keep out rivals? Where are the rivals coming from? And so we looked at newspapers. I'm going to indulge me. You're the next speaker, I guess. Are you? No. <laughs> no, who's the next speaker? I'm going to undermine <laughs> time. But so we're looking at newspapers and saying, you know, where's the rivalry coming from in newspapers? And what's the value of independent newspapers? as in small independent newspapers versus the big groups and the information sharing and understandings around that, particularly in community newspapers. So we're looking at how do the big firms manage to protect. It's the insiders and outsiders. How do the insiders keep the outsiders out? Um, so that's the other one. But opportunity, essentially, um, an exclusionary role, exclusionary conduct. Okay. Um, 